friends, we now uh, go to the uh, second part of the discussion uh, where uh, uh, in the play uh, some kind of a plot, even if it is not there, uh, will be constructed with the help of uh, Professor Pal Nagpal. Uh, there are characters to guide us in the play. Those characters say something and uh, one can take a clue from there and, and talk about the world in which all of us live in the mid 20th century. So, with, with these things in mind, then uh, Professor Pal Nagpal, we will, will try to uh, capture uh, some thematic points uh, that have been raised in the play and that reflect upon <coughs> the world in which we live. So, Professor Pal Nagpal, please begin. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, so, um, the sense of, uh, you know, the fact that you cannot be certain of uh, time uh, is very, very significant uh, in the first act. And uh, from the first act, you know, where uh, finally, you know, nobody can make sense of uh, what kind of a rhinoceros appeared, how it appeared, whether it was one horned or a two horned rhinoceros and so on, uh, suggesting how even though you see something, Different people see different things. Some people say that, well, it was one horn. Some say, no, it had another horn. The logician says uh, something and, uh, of course, it appears absolutely I mean that it is possible that since its first appearance, the rhinoceros may have lost one of its horns or maybe, uh, you know, uh, two, uh, it may also be two rhinoceroses, both with two horns, may each have lost a horn. So, the logician is suggesting permutations and combinations. So, various permutations and combinations are there uh, in life, but we do not know for certain which one it really speaking is. So, uh, and, and this is brought out uh, very well in the first act. As the play progresses into the second act, which is divided into two scenes, in a sense, this idea that no sense is possible develops further as one witnesses the transformation of humans into rhinoceroses. Can human beings turn into rhinoceroses? What really is Inesco trying to say here? Why is he using, uh, you know, in a sense, uh, you know, this idea, this trope of the transformation uh, in this play? Uh, at the very basic level, he, what he's also saying is that meaning is not possible. The meeting, for example, in another play, the ball soprano that I mentioned earlier, there is a meeting between uh, Mr. and Mrs. Martin. The characters are termed Mr. and Mrs. Martin and uh, they uh, seem to have forgotten who they were and they finally, when they talk to each other, they realize that, uh, you know, uh, they are married to each other. And uh, the house of Mary uh, totally turns this around as she says that Elizabeth and Donald are happy to be able to hear me. I can let you in on a secret that Elizabeth is not Elizabeth and Donald is not Donald. And here is the proof. The child that Donald spoke of is not Elizabeth's daughter and they are not the same person. So, you know, Mary goes on about, you know, uh, how both of them uh, have children with uh, different eye colors, but, you know, uh, it's, it's not the same child. So, Donald's daughter has one white eye, one red eye. It goes on like this. Thus, all of Donald's system of deduction collapses when it comes up against the last obstacle, which destroys his whole theory. Now, this is precisely what is also happening in a rhinoceros, that whatever system you use to deduce meaning, the system is challenged. It does not work. It cannot deliver the kind of certitude and the kind of meaning that one is really speaking, looking for. So, if we look at the second act, a lot of characters... Here are, of course, also, in a sense, their way of thinking is uh, uh, questioned and uh, challenged and uh, at times, you know, a slightly more ironic uh, approach is taken. So, Botard, who's a former school teacher and uh, works in Dudard's office as a realist, believes only what he sees and despises all journalists because, according to him, they uh, make up information. So, he says he likes things to be precise. He says, uh, scientifically valid I've got a methodical mind. So, his realist approach, uh, the scientific method, also uh, in uh, the structure of rhinoceros, it collapses because uh, finally, uh, you know, Botard, who does not want to accept uh, this or does not want to believe that human beings are changing into rhinoceroses, finally, at Mr. Buff's transformation, is compelled to accept this. And he says that, to begin with, he says that 
this is just like uh, you know religion the opiate of the people so but the end of act 1 scene 1 disproves botard's claims and later in the play of course like all other characters except for berenger botard too uh, transforms uh, you know changes into a, a rhinoceros so and botard when he sees uh, you know the rhinoceros is unable to explain this which means that no way of no collective structure established structure of understanding life and giving meaning is working here which is why the absurd idea the absurd condition of human beings transforming into rhinoceroses is taken here let me pose this question to you professor pal nagpal uh, is rhinoceros a character in the play does it have legs does it have arms does it have a mind does it have eyes but what what is uh, rhinoceros or is it it's the crystallization of an idea that is inherent in human existence if one is to talk as pompously as that so i think uh, there are two uh, ways of looking at uh, uh, you know approaching this question one of course is at the thematic level where uh, you know as mentioned that rhinoceros the idea here is not about humans t- turning into rhinoceroses mm-hmm. i think human beings turning into the animal within them mm-hmm. that is the idea and in that sense in terms of you know uh, the idea is to be progressive and move ahead which is to become more civilized to become more humane however over here the human beings instead of becoming more humane are actually y- turning into the animal within them and they, they are losing their humanity they are losing their humanity mm-hmm. so they are in a sense moving back in time this movement back in time in that sense is something mm-hmm. that is uh, you know i mean somebody act 2 scene 2 is about the entire scene is devoted to jean's trans- uh, transformation into a rhinoceros jean is somebody who's very sure of himself is very very upright is very cultured and uh, you know he's uh, uh, doing all the right things at that the society expects him to do mm-hmm. but he is also turning into a rhinoceros and it's a gradual mm-hmm. transformation that mm-hmm. is mapped out in in the in the previous part of the discussion you talked about evolution Yes. and uh, human beings you know have finally evolved and uh, now uh, you seem to suggest and uh, this suggestion was very much there in the uh, previous discussion uh, that you know we are going back into evolution where where before humanity something existed maybe that was higher rhinoceros and that is now revisiting human beings now now that they were, they have been freed from it so is, uh, what is the the point? animalless that is mm. that is where which is anarchic which is not making uh, uh, you know which is not leading to any kind of a humane structure mm. and uh, what and we might disagree but in inesco's plays this uh, the production of the animalless is related to a kind of a uh, collective uh, uh, structured identity mm-hmm. so this following of a collective structure i structured identity and his complete distrust of all <laughs> collectivity for this reason mm-hmm. is what is producing uh, the animalless can you know uh, uh, shah's uh, transformation to a rhinoceros in that sense is located in terms of the structure centrally in the play mm-hmm. and uh, uh, you know makes us think about despite all this talk about culture where are we headed what are we doing are we are we humane in our approach uh, do we have do we recognize other people as co human beings or are we uh, you know really speaking going back on it so there is a kind of a dilemma that human beings are facing whether they have to go f- forward into the future uh, more evolved human beings would be the result and uh, that one has to go backwards and because one doesn't want to go backwards therefore one resists you know uh, that kind of threat that is coming from the past would uh, would you agree with this kind so of thing so this resistance is what uh, you know needs to be uh, understood i guess more deeply in this play because mm-hmm. uh, this gradual uh, you know with people turning into rhinos again you know i mean the idea is not literal here the idea is to kind of you know uh, understand how people are probably becoming more uncivilized and uh, more uh, you know anarchic in their approach Uh, so on the one hand they are becoming an archaic but gradually one person looking at the other everybody is turning into the same and the term that is used in the play and is central to it is rhinoceritis it oh. has become a kind of disease it mm-hmm. is it is spreading 
and nobody wants to be left out of the you know uh, uh, mainstream so everybody is gradually following the same and this this kind of generates more anarchy and the question in front of berenger and uh, that's something that uh, we will be taking up you know his uh, final speech in act 3 is uh, about you know how to cope with this how to deal with this so um, in terms of you know act 2 scene 2 uh, uh, and jean's transformation uh, moral standards he says hey, i'm sick of it we need to go beyond moral standards nature has its own laws morality is against nature and this is uh, coming from somebody you know who's uh, actually uh, believed in a very very uh, uh, established system of things and berenger says there's a whole herd of them in the street now an army of rhinoceroses surging up the avenue where can i get out that is the question that he asks and that is a question that one needs to uh, uh, really ask to actually enter the play and to understand it so where can i get out is it possible for somebody like berenger who's been indifferent to any kind of established collective structured system of thought what does he do about it he does not want to join what he calls this herd and uh, you know how does he come out of it so berenger realizes that you know uh, this kind of uh, the disease rhinoceritis that is there now is it is a question that is posed about how to move out of this and the third act takes us through the possible options for example we have dudard and we have daisy thinking about an idyllic society that they will begin but this is not possible both in their very different ways and then daisy along with uh, berenger thinks that you know they can start a absolutely new uh, uh, you know uh, uh, civilization of human beings that will be against the rhinoceroses but both of them uh, are unable to resist this which means that what inesco is also telling us is that it is not easy to resist this how does one manage to resist it so they do not have the strength to go against the herd and they end up joining them like the others before them it's interesting how in the, in the third act we get to know how bota the logician all of them have turned into rhinoceroses so in the third act what is explained to us is the norm what is the norm the norm is to be the rhinoceros the norm is to be anarchic the norm is to uh, you know bring out the animalesque within now in this kind of a setup what does berenger do and berenger's speech at the end of the play is a summing up in a sense of a lot of issues that are raised in the play and he e- explores what really speaking is the way out so one of the answers that he has is will power use your own will power to resist it and berenger asserts this and he says that you know he cannot get used to this rhinoceritis so uh, you know and and who is normal really speaking when we say that this is normative what is normative so where at the beginning of the play to be human was normative the rhinoceros the human turning into the rhino and understand this at the allegorical level the human turning into the rhino was in a sense an exception but by the third act to be a human being is the exception so uh, as as daisy says you know she says that you know uh, after all perhaps it's we who need saving perhaps we are the abnormal ones because all uh, the the entire structure and the aesthetic of society is defined now by the rhinoceros and so as she leaves uh, you know when um, uh, berenger also uh, looks at himself he feels that he is ugly because the rhinoceros is more beautiful because everybody else around him is a rhinoceros so the only solution berenger berenger says is to convince them but convince them of what these are lines from the final speech in any case to convince them you will have to talk to them and to talk to them he says he'll have to learn their language or they'll have to learn mine but what language do i speak what is my language am i talking french yes it must be french but then what is french what does french mean 
to the rhinoceros. So, language itself has no meaning in this process of transformation because the rhinoceroses, they don't speak. They only have sounds and they're trumpeting and so on, making a lot of noise. So, the language of the civilized being is now an exception. So, when he hangs the pictures, the people, he, you know, he finds them to be ugly and he's, he, he, he contrasts it with the rhino. And, and this is where I think something very interesting happens. It also tells us how our notions of beauty are also normative. What is beautiful is what is normative. And so suddenly, as mentioned, that the rhinoceros, that was an exception at the beginning, is the norm and that is what is beautiful. And, and so he feels that he has become, Berenger has become what he calls a monster. And this is very different from, you know, the way one starts in the play. And so he says, now it's too late. Now I'm a monster, just a monster. Now I'll never become a rhinoceros, never, never. I'm so ugly. People who try to hang on to their individuality always come to a bad end. But at the same time, what Berenger says is, oh, well, too bad. I'll take on the whole of them. I'm the last man left and I am staying that way until the end. I am not capitulating. So he is not going to give in to the pressures of the norm. He is not going to give in to the pressure of a society that has that is infested with rhinoceritis, a society that has turned uncivilized, anarchic, animalesque. He would like to preserve his humanity. So he is possessing faith in the individual and saying that the collectivity cannot generate, it is incapable now of generating humanity. So the individual willpower and individuality needs to be asserted for any kind of humanity to be possible. And uh, can here, you address yes. this idea of whether this play is an intellectual play? It is a play that uh, uh, goes outside the parameters of human conduct and uh, you know which uh, tells us that we have to think and uh, think in terms of uh, finding an answer and if the answer is not there then then accepting or rejecting failure. So it's, it's a kind of intellectual exercise on the part of the writer, would you agree? Uh, certainly an intellectual play and uh, 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 I think what is very, very interesting about Rhinoceros is its many lives. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, each time a play is performed, it's true for all plays that each time a play is performed, there is a context to it and the context is that of the performance in, in a kind of uh, the setup in which the play is performed. But here, you know, I think we need to keep the two lives of the play in mind. One, the time period in which it was written and the way it speaks to you know, us today. I think these are two very important areas and that's where I think it works in two very different ways. So, um, where, uh, you know, Inesco was very, very uh, suspicious of any kind of collective, you know, he equated the, the entire uh, idea of uh, socialist thought along with the rise of Nazism and felt that any kind of collectivity was uh, a very, very uh, incapable of generating humanity. And this uh, is an approach that might have had uh, uh, problems of its own kind in its time. And, but today, uh, I think uh, we also need to look at the play uh, in a very different way for its assertion of humanity. And that is, uh, I think, uh, the way the work, uh, play would work, uh, let's say, in the 21st century. So well, that is important. Now that you mentioned 21st century, and already uh, in the discussion you have talked of uh, this play as talking about a disease, and uh, if there is a disease, then let, let's take it literally, then there has to be a vaccine. And if yes. there is a vaccine, then that vaccine should work. And a disease has its own personality. It will find ways to defeat your vaccine, but you will keep on developing a still better vaccine than before. Yes. So is that the metaphor that, 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 that the, the play creates for us to consider? Absolutely. And how uh, in that sense, I think human beings have to continually... Mm -hmm. uh, reinvent themselves also which means change is very important and we need to understand uh, the context in which we are to be able to uh, 
use change to come up with, let's say, a newer method, as you said, a newer vaccine, for instance, mm. to counter the disease. Mm. So this this is certainly an apt metaphor, uh, you know. And in the this, uh, you know, post COVID world, post bracketed, uh, I think it's important for us to. You keep talked this in also mind. about the normative structure of life and uh, things like you know certitudes. And uh, the first, uh, you know, pattern of certitudes was given by religion. This, the second was was by ideas, and the third was that both failed. Yeah. So, uh, what new certitude uh, can 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 one think of in the context? I think over here, uh, there are many ways uh, in that sense of looking at uh, UNESCO's rhinoceros. If we are to answer this question, you know, in the context of the play, that on the one hand, uh, UNESCO is rejecting. All certitudes, mm -hmm. and uh, however good religion, they might tradition, be, religion, tradition, philosophy, philosophy, intellectual thought, systematic thought, uh, rationality, uh, uh, anarchy, uh, extremism, everything is being rejected. Mm -hmm. But he is at the end of it, positing another system, which is that of the individual, because mm -hmm. at the end of it, even that is really speaking a certitude of a certain kind. When, when uh, you know, Berenger says that he's not going to give in. Are there women in the play? Do they play a role? So, uh, Daisy is there and it's interesting that the, uh, uh, you know, one character who actually, that actually, uh, really speaking, resists right to the end. I think mm. she's the only one who's uh, there along with Berenger. Mm. And finally, she too uh, succumbs to the pressure of belonging to the norm and that is Daisy. Mm -hmm. But over here, I think uh, the play functions more at the level of ideas. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, more uh, than, you know, uh, looking at it from the point of view of a play that speaks, let's say, about uh, women in that sense. But it's more about asserting humanity. And this is possible through the individual within UNESCO's problematic. So, he's talking both about the uh, human individual uh, as, as woman and as man. Yes. And, and they fight together. They so fight sometimes together. And uh, there is a different kind of a pattern that as they fight, they also know that they might fail. Uh, as they fight, but over here, uh, Daisy's uh, attempt at fighting this is also uh, as brief as, let's say, Dudad. Mm -hmm. Because Dudad and uh, Daisy and uh, Berenger, these are the three people who we have towards the end of the play. And first, Dudad leaves and then Daisy also feels that, you know, she cannot, uh, uh, you know, uh, continue uh, this kind of, you know, what she would then find to be a very isolated sort of an existence. And it is the individual. And here, uh, I would say Berenger speaks both for men and women mm -hmm. in this sense, that you have to really speaking, uh, ask yourself where you want to belong and ask yourself about how you want to assert your humanity or do you want to give it all up and be succumb to rhinoceritis? Mm -hmm. So I think that is what, uh, really speaking, that is the point at which uh, he uh, UNESCO leaves us in the play. When I read this play many years ago, uh, I, I found that uh, rhinoceros towards the end was weakening and, and it was giving way to uh, the, the kind of human will that you talk about, said it will take care of it and uh, rhinoceros was slightly disappearing from the scene. I had that feeling. Uh, so, uh, two things. One, uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, uh, maybe a problem area with the play would be that, uh, you know, it's complete distrust of any kind of structure. Mm -hmm. So, are there any structures that are good, that are capable of giving us meaning and capable of, you know, providing that, uh, uh, you know, uh, understanding of humanity? So, that is one problem area with the play, which is why I said that, you know, it's two lives. One, the time period in which it was. What were the uh, you know, enabling structures of that time is the question. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, today, how does the play work for us? So this is one thing. But interestingly, uh, you know, uh, now that you bring this up about the speech at the end, so I think it's also important how uh, the second act is so replete with references to the rhinoceroses and the rhinoceroses seem to be taking over, you know, to that point where I think the ranger hangs those pictures and he... Uh, you know, finds himself to be ugly, almost like a monster, to this point of realization. So, it's a very long speech. So, in this sense, the rhinoceroses kind of move away from the, you know, uh, really speaking, uh, uh, fray of the, uh, you know, uh, uh, play. 
and it is uh, what emerges is this idea of human willpower mm-hmm. and uh, but uh, the problem a- area remains uh, you know of its time which is that here it the belief is only in the individual not in a kind of social structure because it's a thought oriented play as, as per your interpretation so can such a such a thought oriented play be staged effectively uh, so you know the very first time that i was actually teaching it uh, you know to uh, the class i uh, for me it was a huge challenge uh, you know how to allow the uh, uh, students how to allow them to visualize how this play is possible mm-hmm. because there is uh, you know d- doing a play uh, discussing a play in the class also carries with it an integral element of visualization mm-hmm. which is why i shared a lot of uh, you know the the pictures from uh, different productions because these give us an idea about what are the different possibilities so in some for instance uh, sound is used and you cannot visibly see the rhinoceroses so there is going to be a lot of uh, you know trumpeting and use of sound in the background but there are plays in which the masks are used uh rhinoceroses masks are used and you can see people running aggressively on the stage and that is another uh, very interesting way of actually capturing this so uh, uh i think uh, it it is a play that can actually uh, be uh, used really speaking to in terms of performance i think it it would generate a lot of interest and a lot of discussion please give us three sentences to some of the play uh Inesco's uh, rhinoceros needs to be understood within the context of the absurd tradition where the world had turned chaotic it was no longer making sense uh, it is an a, it is a playwright's attempt at representing that chaos which is why uh, the play needs to be looked at within its time in all its complexities in all its problems but to also see how the playwright was actually uh, uh, dealing uh dialectically really speaking with the contradictions that the time threw at them and the play also needs to be looked at in terms of the way in which it works for the 21st century audience so friends uh, <clears throat> we have had a very intensive discussion about the play and its applicability to the times in which we live and professor pal nagpal towards the end uh, throws up questions and these questions are there for all of us to consider and the play that way doesn't end it might start a new process of thought new process of interpretation that, that that's what professor pal nagpal has said and let's mull over it let's see how the world is in the light of this play and and consider thank you